And well, let's start with you, David. Come in and, and tell us what on earth it was that gave you the idea to write this book. Unmute. Sorry about that. Thank you for that lovely introduction. And um, thank you also, of course, for all your help on the book. You've been guide, philosopher and friend to this book. Um, I suppose it's rather frightening to think how long it's been in gestation. Um, I first sort of got the idea in, in the mid 2000s. I, I was at that point with a friend of mine, John Lee, writing some books about the language of sport. As I was doing that, I wanted to find some regional dialects when I was writing the cricket book. So I, I read Hutton's final memoir, 50 Years in Cricket. There wasn't much regional dialect in the book because it was ghosted by a southerner. Um, but what there was, was two chapters on this incredible tour, 53, 54, which I kind of knew was the, described as the second most controversial tour since Bodyline. But it just hadn't struck me quite how um, controversial it was. Um, I mean, I suppose we connect Bodyline with three things, don't we? Um, systematic intimidation, physical intimidation of batsmen, particularly Bradman. A diplomatic incident where the sport or more correctly unsportsmanlike conduct causes a massive incident and then a, a nasty star chamber court martial afterwards where of course in the bodyline case Larwood most famously but also Jardine to an extent those were all sidelined as a result well this tour had all three of those things you know the five batsmen were put in hospital admittedly four of them in tour matches uh, but there was lots of negative leg theory in the first test there was a diplomatic incident when Hutton was said to have ignored the Chief Minister of Jamaica. And we'll probably come on later to the fact there was quite a nasty court martial at Lords. So, you know, just to start with, it seemed to me to be uh, an extraordinary thing. And then I mean, in the index to the book, I, I, try, I tried to sort of list what I thought were the major incidents. And there were 18 of them. <laughs> there were quite a few minor incidents as well. But you know, just, just to run through a few of them, there was a riot. The first riot, I think, in, in modern test cricket. There'd been a few incidents on Lord Harris's tour of Australia, but I think that's the first riot. A stand was burnt down, you know, purportedly uh, an arson attack. An umpire's family was attacked. Uh, then an umpire was allegedly racially abused by um, the Yorkshireman, Truman and Wardle. We might come on to that. The, the West Indian captain was roundly booed by his own crowd in, in Jamaica. Uh, Hutton was criticised all across the press in the England and the West Indies for the slowest day in Test cricket to that point. It was soon broken in Pakistan, but uh, England managed to score 128 and 114 overs at one point in Barbados. And then there were all kinds of incidents of dissent. Um, Tom Graveney, you know, who we now think of as the vuncular, character and indeed he probably was most of the time he hurled the ball to disgust and walked off at one point in the fourth test and he also was nearly sent home for swearing at a navy function in Barbados and uh, then you have the young tyros you know Locke and Truman um, Locke was no balled in a test match that's the first time that happened in the 20th century only the second time in test cricket so you know all those incidents I just thought to myself well why on earth has no one written about that and on top of that the cricket was absolutely remarkable. You know, England were 2-0 down. They were a bit like this series just happened. They looked dead and buried after two tests. And they came back to draw the series to all. Hutton leading from the front. He scored 169 in what was then British Guyana. Probably the best, certainly the, the greatest, the last great innings of his career in Jamaica, 205 to um, tie the series. You have all sorts of characters in. George Headley, he was 44. Uh, was brought back by public subscription. He played in the first test. Gary Sobers, um, he was 17, played in the last test. In fact, he became the youngest ever person to take a wicket in test cricket. You have the three Ws, you have Rabbitin and Valentine, you have Compton, Graveney, May, Locke and Laker, Truman and Statham. So there was so much going on, uh, I sort of wondered why no one had written a book about it. So it stuck in my mind for many years I started thinking about it actually doing something about it in the early 2010s my wife kept seeing me reading books about the Caribbean I think she thought we were going on a holiday there but um it was actually for the purposes of research 
And then I think I came to you that we were just just reminiscing about it. I mean, you see. Well, yes, so I think you mentioned before that I wrote an article in the Wisden Cricketer yes. in early 2004, which I think sparked you a little bit, didn't it? Yes, indeed. And Palmer. I went to see Charles Palmer. Charles Palmer was the player manager. We'll come on to that yes. for the tour. Uh, and I'm hoping his son, Tim, is watching this from Canada. And um, he was in the firing line of this tour. And I spent an afternoon with him in Leicester interviewing him. And I found my diary entry um, in which I'm trying to, I, I'm transcribing my interview with him. And it says, the West Indies tour is a massive topic with a giddying number of angles. And this is only a two page magazine article, not a major book, though it's certainly a book that could be written. And that's back in 2004. Yeah. <laughs> you came to me, I think, 13 years later, having done a lot of the research, most of the research and, uh, and most of the writing by that stage. Yes, I think I sent you a press. I mean, you seem such an obvious sympathetic home for the book in that so many of your books about 1950s cricket. Obviously, the book you published um, that Douglas Miller wrote about Charles Palmer, uh, but several of the other books. Jeffrey Howard is a character we might talk about a little bit later. I mean, I think that's one of the most important books about 1950s cricket. Um, so I was glad you were sympathetic to it. But as we were also reminiscing about, you know, I come from an academic background. So as I'd been thinking about it for a very long time, um, I thought I'd write a book, a slightly more academic book, you know, with themes and the cricket in the background. What we actually did, and I'm very pleased with it that way, is we did it the other way around because I think the cricket is so exciting. I mean, when, all the test matches, you know, sort of, there was a very, a match that was boring in the sense it was played on the Trinidad mat. So there were just two innings of 650, essentially, but there's still a lot going on um, during the game. I think it's right that the cricket takes centre stage in the middle of the book. But that said, I think we both agreed that one of the fascinating things about it was it was at a moment in history where you get this, interconnection of personal character you know the character of Hutton is very interesting Jeff Stolmeyer there are many interesting characters Bailey would be another one Everton Weeks but also there are historical forces very much in flux at that time you know that the West Indian Islands are moving towards independence and there is a shift in British society you know from a reason obviously I'm generalizing but a reasonably deferential society after the war that was trying to move forward in a sense of reclamation and relief to a less deferential society in the 1960s. And somehow this tour is a moment where all those kind of things that are in flux are just at a very interesting moment. So we, we sort of took a while, didn't we, to sort of find the right, and I owe you a tremendous debt to, to find the sort of right balance. I hope we found a reasonable balance. I mean, there are some people, who, there are some people for whom there'll be too much cricket in the book, and there'll be <laughs> some people who find there's too much political and social background, but there it is. I had to write, the material had to, sort of do what it had to do to me. So I, well, I, I, I thought, I, I thought, I think one of the great, great strengths of the book is that you never oversimplify and, and you keep the story going at the level of people and all the complexities of the individual personalities and also these social and political forces and, and nothing's that actually that simple. And a yes. lot of writers would have driven through it with a much more yeah. simplistic yeah. analysis and uh, the, the, it, there's enormous joy in the sentences you write you, you write them beautifully and right. and you hold everything in balance all the way through and I, 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 that's part of what attracted me to the book right from the first time you spoke to me I, I thought you you were able to hold the whole thing together without you know, yeah. without sort of creating a black and white narrative with it yeah. um well, it's very kind of you to say so. I mean, I suppose that, you know, if one was doing it in an overdramatic way, one would say Hutton is a, you know, a noble, I think Hutton is a noble figure, by the way, and I suppose he's at the centre of the book, but you'd paint a picture of him being done down at every single turn by um, a bunch of old farts, whatever the right word is, at Lords. And there's an element of truth to that, but I think it is more complicated. Lords did have the game of cricket at heart. And in the West Indies, you paint a picture of, uh, you know, a white oligarchy repressing um, the local population, which, again, is at bottom true. But the local population was a complicated one. You know, there, was a, there were big Indian communities in Trinidad and what is now Guyana. There were lots of other things going on. The sort of parallel of 
race and class in the West Indies can be very complicated. It's, it's connected, but complicated. So I suppose one of the reasons the book is, I'm afraid, quite long is to try and do justice to that. You know, one didn't want to be too simplistic. And the last piece in the jigsaw, I suppose, is I, I met a, I, I must thank him. I don't know whether he's on the call today, but I met a Lancashire member completely by chance at a Lord's Test match. I think I was pontificating about something to my friends and he overheard me, a chap called Nigel Llewellyn. And he kindly, you know, you put a lot of evidence in the book and helped me get a style for it. He really helped me with the narrative voice of it, you know, in the sense that he was a very good sounding board for saying, you know, I think I used the word antimony at one point. And he said, that is not a sort of word I, I think should be in the book. And he was absolutely right. So it was a very long process to get something which I hope, um, and of course it won't be for everybody, um, has that balance to it and has that sense of, I hope a love of cricket, but a respect for the complexities that are behind cricket. Mm. Well, that's, that's terrific. Let's, let's go home in on the subject matter of the book a bit more. And let's start with MCC at this time and how they see a tour to the West Indies, because it's not straightforward. It's not just we're sending out a team to win a test series, is it? it, it yes. uh, there's a sort of imperial mission in a diplomatic... Yes, I think that's right. Yes. And I mean, some and of it again... for that reason, there's unease about the fact that they get into a corner where they're appointing a professional captain which doesn't go down well with some of the expats on the islands, does it? And yes. also this choice of the manager, Charles Palmer, yes. Birmingham University, Grammar School of yes. Birmingham University, and yes. player yes. manager. You know, this is not what some of the people in the West Indies are expecting to be coming over, is it? Yes. Yes, uh, Palmer was Hales Owen Grammar School and um, Hutton was Littlemore Council School. So those are not the backgrounds that would be expected on MCC too. I mean, there's a lot to cover there. Let's, let's try and do it as quick as we can. So the three key figures, I think, at MCC at that time, well, they were the three people who were the driving figures on the selection committee for the West Indies, were Pelham Warner, who was 80, funnily enough, Gubby Allen and Walter Robbins. They all happened to be ex-Middlesex captains. They were all part of what um, Hutton called the inner circle of the MCC. Um, and Robbins is slightly forgotten now. You know, um, Alan and Warner, as many of you will know, have stands named after them at Lords. I'm afraid Mr. Robbins just gets a memorial bench. But he was quite an important character, not least because he was such a shrill advocate of brighter cricket, which, which is part of the thing. You know. But yes, I think those, those three, particularly Warner, had this sense of cricket as a civilising agent, as an agent that brought the empire together. Of course, that's where body line is so important. I think the Cricket Society have just had Mark Peel talking about his book on Jardine. You know, Warner was permanently scarred by the fact he was manager on that tour. He'd gone to preach. I think when he got to Fremantle, I think he got off and started preaching about the gospel of British fair play. And then, of course, he had to leave the Adelaide dressing room in tears when Woodfall told him that there was only one team playing cricket out there. So Warner had that feeling of, I don't want any stinks, any smells on a um, on an MCC tour. I think they'd always been that sense. And of course, particularly in the West Indies, when there was a sense of the, in inverted commas, natives. I must say, incidentally, Warner, Warner was born in Trinidad, went to boarding school in Barbados. He was a genuine lover of West Indian cricket. You know, in fact, in many ways, he might have been the person, along with his brother, who ensured that black and brown players played in West Indies test sides from the start. He said it would be absurd for them not to play. So, you know, Warner, deserves credit in that respect. He also made Constantine captain of a Dominions team in, I think, 1944, when Lindsay Hassett was ill. That was a very brave thing to do at that time. So Warner is not just a paternalistic buffoon, you know, many chin blimp or, or anything like that. He, he genuinely loved the game. He had good intentions in many ways. But he has that feeling, you know, it's a diplomatic, a diplomatic mission almost as much as a cricket tour. But on the other hand, these people, Alan and Robbins as well. Alan, by the way, captained a, a disastrous tour to the West Indies just after the war, where you know, everything went wrong. It wasn't all his fault, but I'm afraid a lot of it was. They had this tension between wanting it to be a diplomatic mission, but they also do want England to win cricket matches, particularly against Australia. And I think that's why they accepted the proposal of the Home Committee, which was a bit more progressive. It had Wyatt on it, 
and it had Les Ames on it, that Hutton should be captain in 52, because they really did want to beat Australia in 53, and they accepted that Hutton was probably the best option. The problem comes when you go abroad. And I, I haven't actually said this authoritatively in the book, because I can't prove it, but I'm pretty sure they wanted David Shepherd to be, cap to be capped on the West Indies tour. They sent him an availability letter, he, if you remember, had decided he wanted to become a church minister. So he was going to start a course at Ridley Hall in Cambridge. So he said no. And what's interesting is Pelham Warner does not ask Hutton if he's available for the tour until the middle of June, um, after Shepherd said he's not available. And in the first committee meetings, a natural assumption is that the, the captain of the tour is going to be an amateur. You know, that they actually even agree his amateur allowance which is going to be 75 pounds from memory um so i think it took them a long time it, they wanted to find an amateur captain peter may was probably a bit too young and he'd just been dropped after the first test in 53 of the other options stuart surrey probably wasn't a good enough player and was never really lord's cup of tea uh, red simpson maybe you know that, that by a process of elimination almost, they accepted that Hutton would tour abroad. But I don't think they were ever comfortable about it. And I think this is one of the reasons that Palmer happens. Palmer was a, you know, a man of great integrity, well-liked. He'd just been, he'd been made, well, he captained in Leicestershire. He were actually in a fight for the championship, among others, with Sussex, who were captained by Shepherd. And I think Gubby Allen had the bright idea of why not take him along as player managers to sort of keep an eye on things which was not unreasonable, and there had been a precedent for that on the previous tour when Billy Griffith took that role. And Griffith was actually the man that Hutton wanted to, to, to go. And I think, uh, this is no reflection on Palmer, who I think did a very good job in a difficult circumstance. I think Billy Griffith may have handled some of that better because he had experience, much more experience of touring and experience of the West Indies. So, you know, I hope that's a summary of, of sort of MCC's position. What's also interesting, as a little aside, is the funny thing is MCC are all also almost more obsessed by the county championship at this time about bright. Remember, there's no limited overs cricket, except in league cricket. There's no county limited overs cricket. So they're very worried about attendances going down in um, county cricket. For example, in the Coronation Ashes, television was only allowed for two hours of the day on the grounds that they didn't want to stop people turning up to county championship matches. And they also have this obsession with brighter cricket. They don't want the test team to play unentertaining cricket or, or, play, or in Bailey's case, do sort of um, disreputable things like negative leg, leg theory. They don't want that to contaminate the county championship. So it's, it's strange. It's different to today when, of course, we're used to all the emphasis being on the test team. An element of MCC's attitude to Hutton and Bailey is, you know, this isn't the sort of thing, you know, defensive batting and short pitch bowling and, and, you know, basically playing the game as hard as possible. This isn't the sort of spirit we want to see in our county game. So all of that's bubbling away, I think. And of course, Hutton takes that all with him as he, as he goes, quite aside from all the problems he's going to face on the ground when he gets there. This tension within MCC between wanting to win and wanting to play the game properly is very strong. And of course, it's exacerbated by our friend E.W. Swanter. He was this sort of unofficial nuncio of, of Lords. He wrote for the Daily Telegraph. I have to say, I've got a, as I did this project, I have more and more time for Swanton. Um, that it always raises a laugh, that remark that's attributed to Raidingworth, that he was too much of a snob to be seen in the same car as his chauffeur. But um, he was never a bigot, I think, um, with the possible exception of the Japanese who imprisoned him in the war, where that's perhaps understandable. You know, he loved West Indian cricket and he was by no means unfair to Hutton on this tour. You know, he, he sympathised with a lot of Hutton's problems. But it is fair to say he once made the comment that Hutton was more of a staff, a staff officer than a commanding, than a commanding officer. You know, I think he definitely had that view, which a lot of people at Lords had, that it needed someone of officer class, someone of public school education and preferably Oxford school education. Oh, sorry, Oxford education. Um, that someone of that class was the right person to sort of look after the ranks on a sensitive tour. And they had the same feeling the next winter in Australia, which we'll probably come to, where again, they tried to get rid of her. I mean, there was a, there was a, a pretty treasonous campaign by half of MCC to get rid of him, which he survived, I think, by the skin of his teeth, and which I think probably 
figures like Harry Altham and possibly Baronet Hovingham, who was the father of the Duchess of York, were probably the people who saved Hutton there. Um, so there's all that going on behind Hutton, and he keeps getting telegrams throughout the tour, you know, telegrams saying, don't talk to the press, or speed up, or get your overrate up, because yeah, Gubby Allen had this obsession with slow overrates. Um, he was very proud of the fact that even though he captained England to tours where they always lost, that they bowled their overs quickly. Uh, so Hutton keeps getting these telegrams, you know, left for him in these hotels in the West Indies, you know, these short telegrams saying, speed up, hurry up, you know. Um, so he has that to deal with, as well as all the things he's got to deal with on the ground.